Thank you. Um, now for our final masterclass, I'd like to introduce Praveen Youssef Fakail, a cybersecurity and privacy professional at Ingram Micro, who's going to talk to us about how the blockchain technology is influencing cybercrime. Welcome. Good afternoon, guys. Okay, let's try that again. Good afternoon, guys. Yeah. Super. So I've been given the difficult task of keeping your attention on the third session just before the break. So I'll try my best to keep it short and effective. So thank you so much for the introduction, ma'am. Uh, my name is Praveen Joseph. I'm a cybersecurity and privacy consultant and a trainer as well. So I'd, I'd, my sessions usually go more on, in terms of training. Um, let me start by asking you a simple question. Do you recognize this person? Okay, I wouldn't be surprised. So what I'll do is I'll just play a small trailer of this movie, and let's see what happens. It's called the Silk Road, Silk Road. a billion-dollar online marketplace for illegal it's like drugs. The eBay for drugs. The elusive ringleader known, known as, as the Dread Pirate Roberts. Who is the Dread Pirate Roberts? Authorities say they the have their guy. Year-old Ross Albright. Is he the man they call DPR? Plenty of evidence suggests that he was involved in the Silk Road. They seized his laptop while he was logged in. But I interviewed the Dread Pirate Roberts. The first thing he told me was that there are multiple Dread Pirate Roberts. There was more than one person. At least two other people, if not three. There's a huge dispute that he could have done what he did. He's not the guy that I'm reading about. People don't have a clue who Ross really is. I know, I know, I'm his mother. I'm gonna say good things about Ross. Nothing has been proven at all. How did you find the server? They're not saying. This was playing fast and loose with the truth. NPR is serious about what the Silk Road meant. They don't really care about money. It's not about selling words. It is to make a political statement. Silk Road is not the first place to have sold drugs on the internet, and it won't be the last. The white knights in shining armor, that's a false narrative. We are the darkness. Okay. Let what do you think about this movie? What do you think it's talking about? There's something called the Deep Web, which is the name of the movie as well. Have you heard of this? Some of you have. Can I see a show of hands, please? Have you heard of the Deep Web or the Dark Web? Perfect. Were you guys in yesterday's session as well, by any chance? Okay. I see a few repeats. Great. All right, guys, w when was the last time anybody in this room did a Google search? Was it yesterday, this morning, or two seconds ago? Googling. Two seconds ago. We, we search on Google almost impulsively. It's like, it's like second nature to us today. But have you thought about the process that unfolds each time you look for something on the web? When you think about information, you can, you can classify data into predominantly three categories when you think about it from a security perspective. Public, confidential, and top secret. Straightforward stuff. When you look for, let's say, how does a blockchain work on the internet, Google is going to crawl through a number of web pages. There's a process called spidering that happens. The most relevant content to your search query is thrown up. If you're going to ask a question like to Google, what is the money that the top customers of my competitor bringing to them? Obviously, this is a piece of data that falls in the second category, confidential. Google is not going to help you there. You're going to need access to a server, which is, which is possibly on the internet, but you'll need to authenticate yourself to get this piece of information. You'll need a username and a password at, in terms of minimum, minimum authentication conditions. If you're going to ask Google, assuming you're a cyber criminal, how can I sell drugs on the internet, theoretically speaking? This is something that falls under, under the category extremely, extremely critical information, extremely confidential information. You don't put this sort of information on, on the regular web. With this understanding, you can try to categorize the whole World Wide Web into three, into three layers, like you see over here. All right, so what I'm trying to show you here is like an iceberg. You have the surface web, which is the regular, every pub, every, um, regular public internet that everyone in this room uses day-to-day -day basis. 
what is the circumference of the Earth, what is the capital of the Netherlands, all sorts of public information. Google, Bing, Facebook, all of this lies there. The moment you, create a, uh, you, you post a photo on Facebook and you restrict the audience to only your friends, you're creating content on the deep web, the next layer. This is what I'd call confidential information. Assuming you're a cyber criminal and you decide that you want to use the World Wide Web to reach your customers, to transact, to get paid, and to be anonymous throughout the whole process, the dark web is where you get. All right, what is the dark web and how is it different from the rest of the web? And what does blockchain have a role to play in this? This is the theme of my presentation. Okay, guys, I've got like 20 to 25 minutes now, so I'll try to keep it, like I said, short and effective. If you have any questions at any point, please feel free to stop me. If not, we'll park them towards the end, right? Okay, now, why do cyber criminals love the concept of the dark web? You know that the dark web essentially is a place where you can be anonymous, you can't be traced, and you can get paid. If I'm a criminal, this is all that I need. Now, when we use the internet, we use Skype, we use WhatsApp for communications, the governments have access to our biometrics. Even if you're traveling from one country to the other, at immigration, you need to, you need to submit your fingerprints or your retinal, retinal eye scans. If you're using Google, Google, I mean, Google pretty much is the internet today to us. Every single app that you use, that you, that you own, every location that you travel to, your food habits, your sleeping, wake-up patterns, everything, Everything is available to Google today, and they can create a profile of each and every single person in this room. Facebook, social media is something I can walk out of. I just deactivate my account, it's all right. But Google, no, it's not so easy, right? If I'm a cyber criminal, this is the sort of tracking that I want to be 10,000 feet away from. What I do is I get on the dark web. What is the dark web and how does it work in relation to the, to the regular web? Let's see. Assume you're on this particular PC with Chrome installed on your, on your laptop. You enter www.google.com. Now, let me, let me make it clear. I'm not an enemy of Google's. I'm just trying to give you some facts, all right? Assume you type google.com. Your internet service provider resolves www.google.com into the corresponding IP address, contacts the servers. Google.com servers respond. You get the data within less than a fraction of a second, and you start searching. This happens a million times, a billion times every second. We don't even think about it. Assume you type www.gibberish.onion.com. Sorry, Chrome is not the kind of browser that's going to make sense out of that. Internet Explorer, Firefox, you name it, Safari, whatever it is, it's not going to make sense. On the dark web, every single web page has the .onion extension. It, .com, .ae, .nl, .gov, none of this makes sense there. It's all .onion. You need a specific browser like, like Tor, have you heard of Tor? Don't tell me you haven't, OK? I know there's people in this room who've definitely used Tor. Tor is the de facto browser of choice across the world if you are going to be active on the dark, on the dark web. All right? It stands for the onion router, which essentially is the way in which your packets get routed, they get encrypted, and uh, transmitted on the dark web. All right? it, the dark web is not different from the internet. It is the internet the regular internet that you and I use, except it's a different way of using the internet. All right, in yesterday's college day, some, uh, one of the speakers told us, every new form of invention, there can be a good side to it or a bad side to it. I like that example he said, which was the ax. You can use an ax for either cutting wood or for malicious purposes. The internet also has the same things, the same concepts. All right, the dark web is where all this actually comes to life. I'm gonna show you some slides, some screenshots from the dark web as well, okay? So how does, how does onion routing keep you confidential? That's, that's what I want to tell you about right now. Assuming I want to send a packet from here to Rachel, who's sitting there. All right? <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. Uh, assume I want to send a packet to Rachel. I'm on the dark web, the onion router. What I'll do is I'll select three random people in this room. My browser does it for me. I don't even know these people. The Tor will do it for me, selecting three random people in this room and sending the packet first to hop number A, hop number B, hop number C, and finally over to Rachel. As, since there are only three hops, my packet is going to be encrypted thrice, once, twice, and thrice. Now here's the catch. It's not usually three, it's 6,000 hops. So one packet gets encrypted 6,000 times, and when Rachel receives it, by the time she gets it, it's decrypted as well 6,000 times. And each hop doesn't know me, it doesn't know Rachel. It only knows who's the, person, who's the hop before it, who's the hop next to it. So essentially, my, my communications are encrypted up to 6,000 times, which itself is difficult to crack. 
and the, pa the, path, the path that you take is extremely random. You can see those tiny blue arrows changing there. Yeah? If you decide to get on the dark web, guys, if you decide to, all you need to do is download Tor and, and know where to go. You need to know the links. The problem is not everybody knows these links. Navigating the dark web is not really easy, and it's not designed to be easy for obvious reasons. If you don't know what you're doing, it's very likely that you would be clicking on what we call a phishing link or downloading a virus onto your PC inadvertently. Right? Have you heard of phishing? Absolutely, yes, perfect. Uh, so from the world of cybersecurity, you can imagine. It's not just the criminals who are active on the dark web. You can have law enforcement agents as well. You can have friendly people or even whistleblowers, so to speak, people who are trying to speak out against malicious government agendas, journalists who are trying to trace or track these whistleblowers, let's say, and plus you can have the criminals as well. How big is the dark web? And why did I start with a picture of, that, of, the, of the individual on the first slide? This guy. This person is Mr. Ross Ulbrich. He is credited with finding or founding a website called Silk Road. Silk Road is the Amazon of the dark web, except it's far bigger than Amazon itself, far more powerful. This is the platform that you need to get to in case you want to engage in purchasing, uh, purchasing illegal contraband goods, hiring a hitman, if you need to launch a ransomware attack, all sorts of criminal activities. Silk Road is a kind of place where this happens. Now, let me, let me make it very clear in terms of a disclaimer. I work for this excellent company called Ingram Micro. Neither me nor my employer, we endorse any of the, uh, the slides that I'm going to show you. These are criminal activities that, that Silk Road is known for, and people get, actually get on these sites for these kinds of things. So this is a screenshot of Silk Road. Those are the apparent fake IDs that Mr. Ross had. All right. Now, is Ross Ulrich the actual founder of this website? It's not been proven yet. That's what the movie debates. There are multiple people um, who, are, who are apparently behind founding this particular website. And the pseudonym of this particular founder, Dread Pirate, Dread Pirate Roberts, it's apparently used by more than one individual. All right. What else can you do on the dark web? You've heard of ransomware. Is that a yes or a no? Perfect. What I do in ransomware is I access one of your PCs. I encrypt your files without your permission, without your knowledge. And then when you try to access your files, all you see is the data that I've decided to put on your laptop, which is encrypted data. If you need me to decrypt your files for you, I will demand that you pay me. All right, you need to pay me. And usually when a cyber criminal adopts this model, he or she will demand payments in what we call bitcoins. This is where blockchain interlinks with the dark web. All right. Now, when I told you earlier, if I'm a cyber criminal who's trying to, uh, trying to transact in, in business models like this, I need to be anonymous, I should not be trackable, and I need to get paid. This is where Bitcoin is actually supporting cyber criminals. All right? This is where the dark side of Bitcoin comes into the picture. Like you know, the, the story with cryptocurrencies, the story with Bitcoins is not all bad. There is a lot of models, a lot of business models where blockchain is actually helping organizations succeed for genuinely good purposes. But of course, it's not too long before criminals as well see the potential, and they start adopting them. All right. So ransomware, this is one example of, a, of, a, of crimeware as a service. If you decide that you want to engage in ransomware, you want to launch a ransomware attack against somebody and make some bitcoins out of it, please don't, first off. But if you decide to, all you need to do is you don't need to have any sp specific coding expertise. You don't need to know what encryption is. All you need to know is how to get onto this particular website. All right. And then here you can clearly specify how many bitcoins you want. After how many days will the ransom be doubled? After how many days will the files be deleted forever if the payment is not made? Did you hear about WannaCry last year? Can I see hands? All right, that's quite a sizable number. Guys, when, since I'm in the cybersecurity space, all I can say is I'm really happy WannaCry happened. Well, I'll tell you what it was, but for, for professionals like us in this field, it actually got people to wake up to the realities of cyber criminals and cyber threats. WannaCry was one of the biggest ransomware attacks in the history of the world. It happened in May 2017. 230,000 computers were infected across the world, across the world, guys, including the biggest corporations in the world. All right? But in terms of business model, was WannaCry successful? They, they were able to uh, affect 230,000 computers. 
probably only 10% of these guys actually paid the ransom. All right? But for professionals like me, cyber, cyber security professionals, WannaCry actually got people to wake up and listen to us, listen to messages we've been preaching for, for almost a decade right now, in terms of the importance of cyber security. All right? Ransomware, one of the most lucrative business models for cyber criminals, just encrypt somebody's files. In fact, yesterday I was giving the example to students. You have your thesis submission tomorrow, and if I just encrypt your files in the morning, off the submission, you're going to panic. You're going to pay the money to me. All right? But in terms of ransomware, 99% or I'll say even 100% of the cases, when you pay money to the criminal, you, can, you cannot expect to get your files back. It doesn't work that way. All right? You pay money to the cyber criminal, your, your money is lost, your files are lost. You're not going to get your files back. I've never seen a single case where people were able to get the files back after paying money to the criminals. This is the irony, and it's the truth, from my experience at least. All right? Another example is... It's not working, so... Can you help me, please? Thank you. Another example is stolen credentials. Every single week, you hear some news or the other of companies, user accounts, passwords being stolen. They get hacked. In fact, just last week, Facebook announced that 50 million usernames and passwords were compromised. Do you know where most of these accounts end up? On dark websites. Your Facebook username and password goes for just about $2 on a website like this. It's just $2 for a username and a password. All right? If I were to have your Facebook credentials, what would I do with it? Predominantly impersonate you. That, that would be my key objective. Try to make somebody in your friends list fall, fall victim to a phishing scam that I try to launch because they think I'm you, right? So uh, stolen usernames and passwords definitely land up on the dark web. Stolen payment cards as well. You've heard about this beautiful standard called PCI DSS. I'm not surprised if you haven't. Every single card in the world that belongs to Visa, MasterCard, Visa or MasterCard, they have to comply with, a, with an extremely technical cybersecurity standard called PCI. Organizations, the problem is they don't, they don't implement it really well. So it's really easy for your credit card or your debit card numbers to get hacked. If I, as a cyber criminal, have your 16-digit card number and, and, God forbid, I have your CVV as well, it's just a matter of minutes for me to create a new card that looks just like yours. Clone your card. So there are lucrative uh, business opportunities for criminals to actually clone cards and sell them as well on the dark web. You can also purchase fake passports, fake currency. All right, I've not included those slides here for, for want of time. Now, how is blockchain actually helping in all of these? Like I said, as a cyber criminal, I need to be anonymous, I need to be untraceable, and I need to be paid. If you notice in most of these screenshots, payment is accepted in Bitcoin, like you see over here. All right, why, why is Bitcoin actually helping us here? Can you tell me? Anonymous. Yes, sir. Someone said it's anonymous. Can I see your hand, please? Thank you. That's one of the best answers. Thank you. And you, sir, please. I'm, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Okay, that is also extremely relevant. Cool. So let me start by actually trying to define what blockchain is and what cryptocurrencies is, guys. Now, I know the theme of the whole conference is blockchain. I'm, I'm sure you've seen a lot of actual industry implementations. But what I'm going to do right now is trying to define what blockchain is, trying to see if I can get you to understand in a bit more detail how the blockchain actually works. All right. Who here is familiar with the concept of BitTorrent? I don't need to see your hands. Just think to yourself. Okay, <laughs> when you say BitTorrents, the first word that comes to your mind is peer-to-peer, -peer, P2P. A P2P network is something that is similar in, in the dark web as well as in blockchain. What, what happens in a peer-to-peer -peer network is all of us in this room, we decide to come together. Whatever computing resources we have, we decide to share with each other. There's no central authority that is controlling the way we transact with each other. We decide we have a uniform hierarchy across all of us. It's a flat, flat organizational structure, let's say. This is a P2P network. Uniformly, we, dis we distribute our resources. We, we ourselves govern the integrity of the structure and the way in which the structure can actually be modified. All right? This concept of peer-to-peer -peer is foundational to both the blockchain as well as to the dark web. All right? Now, let me give you a simple example to show how blockchain can have implications in the way business is conducted. A simple example would be that of 
media that I put up right up there. Traditionally speaking, we have these news corporations, news houses, media houses, who are in charge of creating content, which we call news, and publishing it. And we as end customers or end users, we read it, we frame an opinion about it, we talk about it, but we have no say literally in terms of how, what, what the next news story is gonna be. With social media, all this has changed. You and I, we can become news creators. You make a video, you, may, you make it go viral, it becomes news. What is news? News is just a story that everyone is listen, interested in. All right, everything can be news. You can, you can create news, you can make news. This is how things work in a democracy, let's say, or in a uniform structure. The same concept is what blockchain tries to endorse. You have a peer-to-peer -peer network like you see here, which is distributed, it's decentralized. You don't have a central entity which is controlling the transactions on a blockchain. Essentially what we do here is we take all of our transactions, let's say, and put them into one distributed network. We don't have a central entity controlling it. It is transparent to every single person in the room, which is point number two. Every single person here sees each other's transactions, and then you can't alter it. Why can't you alter your transactions? Because of one keyword, hashing. Have you heard of hashing? I'll tell you about it in just a minute. Thank you. I'll tell you about it in just a minute when we talk about how a, a, a transaction actually works on the blockchain. All right, so guys, let me give you a simple example of blockchain being used in the industry. Maybe you're familiar with this case, but I'll still take the example of the music industry. What's the deal with the music industry? Now, tr traditionally speaking, there are a lot of problems in terms of how content is being created, how it's being promoted, how people are getting paid, how pirates are controlled. What I'll do is I'll pick the two most relevant problems. The first one being piracy, music piracy, and the second one being royalty. Royalty not being paid to all the stakeholders involved. Now, typically speaking, you have a music creator and you have the recipient, which is you or me, the listener, let's say. Between the creator, which is the artist, and the recipient, there is a large number of entities, which is, you can have the record label like the Sony's or the HBO's of the world. You can have digital service providers like Apple's or Spotify's. You can have filmmakers who want to use the same music in their movies. You can also have pirates the guys who make sure that nobody gets paid for their content, all right? And at the end of the chain, you have the listeners, which is you and me. One of the biggest problems is every time a music file gets played, all the stakeholders need to get their royalty paid. Especially artists, especially new artists, this is not, real, this is not reality. They don't get paid on time, or sometimes they, re they rarely get paid itself. The other problem is, of course, piracy, because almost every song today is, is easily accessible on, pir on pirate run websites. How does blockchain help us to control this problem? First off, the key word for this is what we call a smart contract. What you can do here is you develop a smart contract, you embed the only MP3 file of that song into the smart contract. What is a smart contract? A smart contract is nothing but an application. If you look at any contract, guys, which is fundamental to any business relationship, a contract, it only consists of a number of if-then-else clauses. So you can actually codify all of these criteria into an application, right? So this is essentially what I do in my smart contract. If you're gonna listen to my music, you'll have to pay X dollars, Y dollars, Z dollars to each of these stakeholders. This is what I'll mention in my smart contract. If you need to access my music, you need to go through the contract. There's no other way to download the music file. So piracy is gone. Royalty payment taken care of. If someone has to access my file, they'll have to go through the blockchain. And like you know already, once a transaction is on the blockchain, you cannot alter it. So once a contract is fixed and it's put up there, that's the only place you can download my files from, my music from. All right, all the criteria are laid out. Everybody is equally um, involved. Everybody is equally, uh, equally exposed to the transactions. All stakeholders go home happy. This is, the, this is the, the, uh, the ideal scenario that the blockchain is trying to promote. All right, a few music artists are already adopting this. Now, let me show you how, from a cyber criminal's perspective, blockchain is actually helping them to meet their three objectives, which is being untraceable, being invisible, and still getting paid. Let's take the example of a ransomware victim and an actual cyber criminal who's demanding that he be paid 100 bitcoins for decrypting the files that he is, he is actually encrypted illegally. What happens on the blockchain is both of these entities, they first need to download a bitcoin wallet. You probably know this already, but what is a bitcoin wallet? A bitcoin wallet is a collection of what we call Bitcoin addresses. Each address has a public and a private key pair. 
from cryptography perspectives. And within each address, you can have three bitcoins, you can have 100 bitcoins, it doesn't matter. For every new transaction, it is advisable that you create a new Bitcoin address, like you see over here. So when the sender, this victim over here, decides to pay the, uh, the criminal, what they do is they create a new transaction, which is the one that you see right here. They encrypt it with their public key, and their, their public key, sorry, they encrypt it with their private key. Their public key is already associated with it. Their public key is nothing but their Bitcoin address, or their Bitcoin ID, blockchain ID, let's say. All right, so anybody on the blockchain network can actually attribute that transaction to this particular victim over here. So it's visible to all. A new transaction is created. It is now in, let's say, the waiting list. What happens is this transaction needs to be verified. It needs to be approved. It needs to be added as a block. So what we do is this transaction gets coupled with every other transaction over the next 10-minute window. Now here I'm only showing you four transactions. What happens is each of these transactions gets hashed they get coupled together, and then the, they get consolidated again into one uniform, uh, let's say, mega block of, one, of, of the, ten the, tra the transactions in the last 10 minutes. What do I mean by hashing? I told you I'll explain what the concept of hashing is. Hashing is a mathematical function. You take any input of any length into it, the output always has a fixed length. This is the property of, the, of this mathematical function. Plus. From the output, it's very difficult to get the input. It's extremely difficult. And if there's even one change to the input, the output is completely different. All right, so it, it's one of the fundamental concepts to cryptography. If I need to make sure that a file that I transferred to you has not been modified in transit, what I'll do is I'll hash my file. I'll send you the file, I'll send you the hash value as well. You receive the file, you calculate the hash value as well. If your hash and my hash match, it means the file has not been modified. Straightforward stuff. Let's not get into the technicals. I'll leave it right there. The next step, what I do is I will take the hash of the most updated block, the most recent block on the, on the blockchain. I will link it with my new transaction, with my new transaction block. This is where it becomes extremely difficult for someone to go back and make transactions and make changes to old transactions because each block gets linked to the hash of the previous block. What this means is if someone needs to go back and make changes, like I said, hashing cannot be reversed. It's a one-way function. It is next to impossible, it's actually impossible to go back in time and, and undo all of the blocks that were recently added. Plus, there is this awesome concept called mining which comes into the picture. Miners are volunteers whose job is to verify transactions and, and support the creation of a new block. How do they do this? They try to solve a cryptographic puzzle such that the output of this puzzle has a specific number of zeros. And in order to achieve the specific number of zeros, they need to add a random value to the hash called a nonce. Okay, we also call it salting in, the, in hashing terminologies. They add salt to the input such that the output has a specific number of zeros. Easier said than done, very, very difficult. It sometimes takes, takes days or weeks to meet this condition. But the guy who's successful at, me, at meeting this condition, he is the guy who is able to add a new block, like you see right there and he gets paid in Bitcoins as well, not to mention the transaction fees, all right? So becoming a miner is, uh, is pretty interesting, but it's extremely difficult to win in this game. Super, so from a cyber criminal's perspective, what are the benefits? First off, anonymity is maintained because all you know is, you know me by my blockchain ID over here. You don't know who I am. The second thing is permissionless. Assuming that you need to go and open a bank account with HSBC, let's say, all right? HSBC would predominantly want to do a, a basic background check on you before they, before they actually open the account for you. If I'm a cyber criminal, I will not walk up to HSBC and tell them, guys, I need to open an account so I can receive payments for my criminal activities. No, nobody does that. Nobody in the right mind does that, right? What I'll do is I'll, get, I'll just get going on the internet, download a Bitcoin wallet, and start transacting with a, with a Bitcoin ID. That's about it. No one's going to verify me. No one needs any proof of identification. All you need to do is know how to get there and start transacting. That's it. All right, so there's absolutely no permissions. It's decentralized, of course, because government authorities, there's not much they can do. They know that all the illegal payments are going to one specific ID. They don't know who this person is behind this ID. With WannaCry, we could see that all the transactions, all the payments were being made to a specific ID, but we couldn't really trace who, who this particular individual was which changed last month. I don't know if you've been up to date with the news, but it was the whole WannaCry um, event was attributed to North Korea, to a particular hacker from North Korea. How true are these allegations? I'm not, I'm not the right guy to comment. All right? 
but uh, apparently North Korea has got some skills. Unalterable, assuming your bank account with HSBC was hacked, and the fault was found to be with the security of HSBC servers, not your fault, you can, you can legally go and contest HSBC and you can get a refund. All right, this is possible. With a blockchain, not at all possible. Because like I said, hashing is a one-way function. If I've been paid, I've been paid. I, I'm not gonna pay you back, it's impossible. So for a criminal, I'm gonna be super happy because I'm just gonna take my money and disappear. There's no way anyone's gonna get my, my Bitcoins away from me. All right, so the irreversibility is something which is literally gold to a cyber criminal. How can companies protect themselves from this, from this sort of attack? Guys, now if you look at it, dark web is one platform, blockchain is another platform. But what, are, what is the problem we're really trying to solve? The problem is cybersecurity. When you think about cybersecurity, you need to think about your people, you need to think about your processes, and only then do you start thinking about your technology. All right, guys, I work for this company called Ingram Micro, like I said, I'm part of the cybersecurity business unit. This is pretty much what we offer. We do trainings for people, we go out, do sessions like this, and, and open their eyes to the realities of the, cyber crime, of, of, the, of the world of cyber criminals. We tell them how new technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, what kinds of vulnerabilities they're gonna bring into their environments. What are the privacy implications of their business? GDPR, please tell me you've heard of GDPR. All right, the general data protection regulation, guys, the whole world is looking at the European Union right now because of GDPR. It is one single regulation which is pretty much landmark in the world of privacy. What do I mean by privacy? It's, it's a far bigger field than security. How much control do you as a person have over your data? Let me give you a simple example. Who here does not have a social media account? I don't expect to see more than two hands, I guess. Thank you. I don't, up until one month back, thanks to this wonderful scandal called Cambridge Analytica. Have you heard about Cambridge Analytica? A few nods, right? So what happened here essentially is that my data, although I had nothing to do with it, my data was compromised in a cyber attack. Um, not a cyber attack, so to speak. It was um, a violation of privacy, which was not clearly laid out by Mr. Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, essentially, a, a, a people who downloaded an app, which was supposed to make a personality test or something, their data plus their friend's data was sold by the owner of this app to a company called Cambridge Analytica. This company was influential in President Trump's um, campaign. All right, they were actually providing him with data in terms of how to structure his presidential campaign. I didn't know this app existed. Someone from my friends list used it, and my data was gone. All I got was a notification from Facebook that said, Praveen, your data's probably been out. Here's what you can do. Click on I agree. All right? So <laughs> as, a, as, an, as an end user, all I could do was feel helpless, and I know, and, and, and lo I know a little bit about privacy. So I figured I can just walk out of Facebook, and that's what I did. I deactivated my account, all right? And last week, I hear that 50 million users' credentials have been breached, and I was telling in my mind, who's laughing now, all right? Uh, I'm pretty sure my data would have been out as well in that particular breach, had it still been account active, all right? Guys, uh, in terms of privacy, the question is, how much control do you, as an, as an end user of technology, have over your data, your own data? All right, not mine or somebody else's. When you submit your data to companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, whatnot, if they are gonna share it with somebody else, you need to consent to it. You need to exp express active consent, not just consent if it is sensitive personal data. GDPR is actually bringing that power to you. All you need to be is a legal person physically located in the European Union, that's about it. It does not care about anything else. All right, any physical person pr pr physically present here, is covered by GDPR, and guess what? You can still be in Dubai, you can be in Asia, wherever, it doesn't matter. If you are processing data of an individual in the EU, you will have to comply with GDPR, all right? So that's the reason the whole world is actually looking at the EU in terms of GDPR. It came into effect on 25th May 2018. It's still unclear what needs to be done in terms of compliance, but we know there's a lot of work, a lot of work. And guess what? If you don't comply, your fines can be as high as 10 or 20 million, or 4% of your worldwide total annual turnover, which is massive. All right, British Airways was just hacked a couple of weeks back. They might be uh, penalized under GDPR, we are yet to see. All right, if it is proven that they did not have sufficient due diligence measures, they might have to pay up. They might have to cough up some really, really massive fines. Super. So training is where we talk to organizations and tell them that 
you know, your employees need to be enabled in terms of security, in terms of privacy. DLP is the second part of it. What do I mean by DLP? For an organization, you have what we call a trusted perimeter. A trusted perimeter is a, is a boundary within which I'm okay to share my personal data or my, my corporate data, let's say. This boundary might consist of my employees, my customers, my partners, definitely not my competitors. The moment my data steps out of this boundary, I have a data loss incident. The moment I've been hit by ransomware, I've got a data loss incident. The moment my data's been breached, like Facebook or British Airways that I was telling you about, we've had a DLP incident, all right? Organizations need to protect themselves against this. The last one is monitoring the dark web, which is where you have what we call threat hunters. Companies like Symantec, McAfee, they do this, Kaspersky, they do this, wherein they monitor new trends in terms of cyber attacks. What kind of attacks are organizations facing such that their competitors can be protected from? Why am I telling you about all this? Guys, like I said, I work for a company called Engram Micro. If you haven't heard about them, it's fine. We are the largest tech distributor in the world. We work with all of these tech companies plus a, a super long list. Our office here is based in Utrecht. I myself, I'm based in the Dubai office, flew down for this particular conference. We offer trainings, we offer DLP solutions, we offer monitoring uh, or SOC solutions, so to speak, as well. Um, if you need to know a little bit more about any of these, please feel free to talk to me, and I'm going to be around. This is a portfolio of services, trainings, as well as, as well as the vendors that we offer, that we distribute. Guys, if you have any questions, now would be the time. Thank you. Yep. Praveen, thank you. It was absolutely fascinating. I mean, so much stuff that's difficult to get your head around, but you're thank clearly you. the expert in the field. Um, do we have any questions? Before we do, I actually have one. Who created the dark web? We really don't know. We don't know, honestly. So like I said, for the internet has been around for a long time. The concept of dark web, um, it's not something that we can attribute to somebody, but there is a theory that Tor itself was founded by the US military for their own communications. Yep. Okay, questions? Yeah, yeah please. Just wait for the mic microphone, please. So this movie that you were showing, right? Um, if it's the dark web and everything is untraceable, how would you find the, this guy, this person? How do they find someone like this? See, that's the whole catch. You can't really prove that this is the individual. And apparently, we had the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Authority, the CIA on this person's track, tracks for about three to five years before they eventually tr uh, caught up to him. But the thing is, the movie debates that this is the actual individual who founded the dark web. Apparently, there's more than one individual. All right, that's the opinion of the movie. Um, the reality is you can't, you can't really say with 100% that this is the individual, but when you look at the chain, for example, if I order a fake passport, the passport has to come to my house. All right, so there, are, there has to be other individuals involved as well. It's not entirely virtual. How does my passport co cross customs? How does it cross immigration? I might be placing the order in Japan. The passport is being shipped from Western Europe, let's say. All right, so there are, there are other physical aspects of the channel as well through which you can try and trace these. So if I am snooping on the dark web for such transactions, I try, as an investigator, what I'll do is a little bit of reconnaissance, try to get as much data as possible about the who's and the, and the what's behind that particular transaction, and then try to trace the, trace the actual individuals. From the virtual perspective, it's next to impossible to track them. You'll have to get into the physical world to do it. Thank you. Another question down here. Uh, yeah, you said uh, I can simply download Tor and then go to the dark web. Yep. When do I cross the line that I get a serious problem? So That's a lovely I, question. Can I just huh? do it right now and just uh, search That's for some stuff? Thank you. What, what's your name, please? Niels. <laughs> Sorry. Niels. Niels. Thank you, Niels. That's a lovely question, honestly. So the beauty of being in the European Union is uh, you have a lot of freedom. All right, freedom is the, uh, the foundation of everything legal here, right? Even beyond uh, that in the US, I, I, I personally believe. When I, when I read GDPR, this is what I felt, all right? So everything is open, nothing is blocked for you, uh, and that's actually a good thing. The question is, you need to decide what is good, what is bad, and if you misuse it, you can fall in trouble with the law. With the dark web, there are countries where Tor itself is blocked, all right, let alone the dark web. Tor is blocked, I2P, Freenet, all of these dark web-specific browsers, they are completely blocked, all right? In India, where I'm based, it is legal, completely legal to access the dark web. 
Um, but it, it, and, and I'm sure it's not just India, it's actually the rest of the world. But it's up to you to be careful what you do on the dark web. So if you're going to be um, engaging in some, some sort of you know, purchase of the kind of goods that we saw up there, it is illegal, definitely, and you can be punishable by the law. But if you're, go you're snooping around for research and you can prove that it's only for research, it's fine. Right, thank you. We'll be watching you. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Um, can you tell me what the difference is between dark web and deep web? Sure, sure. Um, so the question is the difference between the dark and the deep web. And uh, the deep web can be, okay, how many of you here have a Gmail ID? Almost everybody, 100%, I'm pretty sure. All your emails on your Gmail servers is essentially deep web. It's just data which is not public. That's all there is to it. it. It's not at all illegal. It's completely legitimate. It's completely legal. Your corporate email IDs, your Gmail IDs, your Facebook photos, which are not public, all of this is what we call the deep web. The dark web, and, and, and let me make it straight, Tor is not required for the deep web. You, you, you can use Chrome, Internet Explorer, any of the regular browsers. The only difference is you need to authenticate yourself with a username or a password, minimum speaking. All right? You've got other layers as well, like biometrics or whatever. It doesn't matter. But the deep web... You don't really need to authenticate yourself. You just need to protect yourself. You need to cover your tracks because of the nature of the, of the transactions on the deep web, which is what we just saw up there. Thank you. Any more questions? Lady here. Are there any reasons why governments should not make browsers like Tor illegal? Are there any reasons they should not illegalize Tor? Yes. It depends on the government. It depends on the government. So if you ask me, um, I'm Dubai where I'm based, uh, it's completely legal to even think about accessing Tor. All right, but India where I'm from, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, so it's really up to the government to decide what level of freedom their people have, right? And um, if, I'm a, if I'm the sort of government who wants to have a close watch on my, on my, um, on my people and prevents things like cybercrime or things like this, I would definitely want to block, want to block Tor. Yeah, so it's really up to the government what sort of agendas they have, what sort of plans they have for the people. We've probably got time for one last question, if there is one. Yep, gentleman up there behind you. Yeah, hello. Um, Hi. My question is, uh, when I order something on Silk Road or any other uh, uh, dark web website, um, I uh, order it anonymous from an from somebody who's also anonymous, I pay forward probably. Uh, wh why would they uh, send it to me when I can never tra trace them back? Uh, yeah, wh why would they even send a product okay. when, I, when I can do nothing about it when I'm being scammed? I got you, I got your question. So why would I, as, um, as a merchant on the dark web, want to even deliver my products or services? The thing is, I am anonymous. My brand is not anonymous on the dark web. So when you get on the dark web, you, you know me by my brand, but you don't really know me. So, so there's still user um, kind of when, the, the, when they give you a review or whatever, yep, yep. like on Amazon. Yeah. So it's crucial to my business that I actually deliver, although it's illegal. <laughs> it's really fascinating. Thank you very much for Thank taking you. us through the dark web and how to get on it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You can't disappear without your flowers. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you, man. Any time, my pleasure. Praveen, thank you. And thank you to all our speakers for their talks this afternoon. Um, it's been a really interesting few sessions. We are going to take a short break now, and you can have a tea and a coffee. And join us again in half an hour, so at 10 past four for the last part of the day. And it's the debates. And that's in the theatre hall. Thank you.